Perfect. So we are 160 participants. The number of participants is still growing. Thank you for having registered so numerous for this event on social economy's vision for a green and fair transition. Uh, please know that we are also live on Facebook and uh, that we have interpretation in various languages. In the right hand sound, in the bottom of your, of your screen, in the right hand side, you will find us an interpretation bottom and you will be able to select uh, or English, French, Spanish, Italian as uh, the language in which, you will, in which you will hear us. We have a high level event today uh, with uh, quite high level speakers. Uh, the event will be opened by your work colleague, Patricia Toya, member of the European Parliament and co-chair of the Social Economy Intergroup, by Esben Giegold, MEP also, and also co-chair of the Social Economy Intergroup, and Juan Antonio Pedreño, president of Social Economy Europe. So without further ado, I will pass the word to uh, Patricia Toya to start this event. Thank you, thank you. Um, good morning to all. Um, I am very happy for your participation. I know participation in, uh, is uh, very high, and um, I hope uh, our work uh, uh, today uh, will be very, very interesting. Um, I will speak in my own language, and uh, as uh, he said, uh, you have a translation. On the, uh, it's possible to uh, listen the discussion in your favorite language. Passo dunque all'italiano. E ringrazio ancora tutti i partecipanti che sono molto numerosi e sono anche molto numerosi dal mio paese, dall'Italia e ne sono molto orgogliosa. Eh, saluto i miei colleghi Sven e gli altri co-chair, saluto Pedrino e penso che anche quella di oggi è una tappa del nostro lavoro. Voglio fare pochissime considerazioni. La prima è che questo è il momento per fare un salto di qualità per il mondo dell'economia sociale nelle politiche europee. Questo è il momento ottimo. Contrariamente al passato, oggi abbiamo una commissione che è attenta, non solo il commissario Schmidt, ma l'insieme del collegio è molto più attento e interessato a sviluppare il tema dell'economia sociale, cosa che non è stata nell'ultima commissione, e forse anche il Consiglio, i vari ministri stanno dimostrando attenzione, lo vediamo nei negoziati quando introduciamo questo tema e dopo qualche difficoltà anche il Consiglio accetta. Il Parlamento è sempre stato molto propenso a sviluppare tutta questa tematica, quindi credo che sia il momento buono. Penso all'action plan che Schmidt sta preparando e per il quale ha chiesto collaborazione al mondo delle associazioni, ai vari paesi, ai ministeri, ai parlamenti nazionali. Penso anche ad altri eh, provvedimenti che sono in corso di discussione nei quali l'economia sociale può trovare con le sue imprese, con i suoi soggetti, uno spazio nuovo rispetto al passato. Vedo Gigol del mio schermo, Sven, e penso per esempio a quando si è messo anche il tema delle imprese sociali nel regolamento InvestEU. Abbiamo parlato di infrastrutture sociali anche nel regolamento del recovery plan, nel provvedimento per la revisione del mercato interno che comprende appunto le SEMIS, abbiamo inserito anche questi soggetti. Quindi c'è davvero una nuova disponibilità, una nuova apertura delle istituzioni europee. Quindi invito il mondo delle associazioni, il mondo del no profit, il mondo delle imprese sociali, delle cooperative, delle BTL ad alzare la loro voce, a portare il loro contributo perché è il momento davvero per un passo avanti significativo. Seconda considerazione, questo è anche il momento perché la crisi del Covid ha dimostrato e purtroppo torna a dimostrare, perché siamo ancora in una fase assai critica, che c'è proprio bisogno di questo contributo. Ce n'è bisogno non solo per il volontariato che ha fatto azioni complementari a quelle pubbliche, ma proprio anche per un protagonismo in prima persona nella fase di eh, aiuto mentre si è in piena crisi e nella fase della ricostruzione. Quindi anche per necessità tutti si stanno rendendo conto che c'è bisogno di queste realtà. Seconda e ultima considerazione. Questo è anche il momento in cui noi istituzioni, noi politici e tutti coloro che hanno una responsabilità dobbiamo capire che il mondo dell'economia sociale è in grande trasformazione, è capace di grande innovazione, continua a ricoprire gli spazi che tradizionalmente ha ricoperto, penso al welfare e a questi settori di cura, ma sta andando per strade nuove, come tutto il mondo dell'economia e della società sta andando per strade nuove 
e come l'Europa stessa chiede di andare per strade nuove. Penso al tema della transizione ecologica, penso al tema ambientale, penso al tema della digitalizzazione. Lungo questi due nuovi assi dello sviluppo dell'economia europea, il mondo dell'economia sociale si sta già posizionando, è già lì con le sue attività, con il suo spirito di sempre, con le sue caratteristiche di sempre, ma con anche eh, coniugando tutto questo, quindi senza perdere i suoi valori, ma portandoli lungo strade nuove. Nel, nel seminario che abbiamo fatto mesi fa, per il lancio dell'intergruppo, ricordo le imprese, in quel caso erano alcune imprese tedesche, ma ce ne sono anche in altri paesi, che raccontavano le loro esperienze nel campo ambientale. E quindi anche questo è un campo che dobbiamo esaminare più a fondo, anche per aggiornare le nostre stesse conoscenze. Io ogni volta che incontro il mondo del commercio sociale, imparo qualcosa di nuovo e vengo a conoscenza di cose nuove. Allora, è importante questo, state muovendovi nel mondo della digitalizzazione e ne parleremo in un altro appuntamento, ma oggi ci racconterete cosa sta avvenendo nel mondo della transizione ecologica e quindi tutto il tema, diciamo, del green, che sapete è la grande e sempre crescente eh, attenzione, diciamo, l'impronta che deve avere lo sviluppo economico, industriale, dei servizi e della nostra società. Io vi voglio dire anche che nel provvedimento che stiamo facendo sull'economia circolare, io sono solo shadow per la mia commissione ITRE, ma tutti i colleghi che sono impegnati, stiamo inserendo anche lì, anche in tutto il campo dell'economia circolare, che vuol dire trattamento dei rifiuti, ma vuol dire anche un ecodesign all'inizio della produzione, quindi a monte e a valle, stiamo inserendo anche lì questa quest opportunità, aprendo qualche porta, insomma, perché questo mondo possa posizionarsi lì o sviluppare le sue capacità laddove si è già posizionato e lavora. Quindi concludo questo mio saluto di intervento, di apertura, dicendo che insomma quello di oggi è un momento di approfondimento ma ne scaturiranno anche delle prese di posizione, degli atti concreti che ciascuno di noi porterà nel suo ambito. Io con i miei colleghi lo porteremo nell'ambito legislativo e di scelte programmatiche, legislative programmatiche e di finanziamento eh, che l'Unione Europea farà, sta facendo e farà nei prossimi mesi. Quindi grazie per questo incontro e spero davvero che la discussione, che sarà senz'altro buona, ci possa dare spunti per aggiornare anche il nostro modo di lavorare, per far conoscere anche queste buone pratiche a tutto il mondo dei vari paesi europei che magari non le hanno ancora sperimentate. Grazie e buon lavoro e rimarrò naturalmente per tutto il tempo in ascolto con voi. Grazie mille Patrizia. Uh, for this uh, for this introductory speech and also for uh, for setting the scene with uh, with all the opportunities that the social economy has ahead of it in this new European mandate. Uh, just to point again, finally, we are 252 participant things here, thanks to everybody. And it is also important to say that we have participants from all over the European Union, but also even from the United States, from Canada. So we have quite a wide range of social economy actors, public administrations, very much interested in this topic. And now I will uh, give the floor to our co-chair of the Social Economy Intergroup, Sven Giegold. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Victor. And uh, thank you, Patricia and uh, Juan Antonio, uh, Monica. This is just great to see all the names in the chat from well-known um, cooperatives, social businesses, and their associations participating in that debate. And I think the debate is just timely. So the European Union, after the, the elections, has chosen for a new lead strategy, the, um, the Green Deal. And now the big question is, uh, how will we finally implement the Green Deal? And their social and solidarity uh, businesses and economy has an important contribution to make. And I would uh, like to open this with a bit provocative statement saying, well, if you have enterprises which by their own constitution have more objectives than just making money, just growing, This is in itself an important signal in a, in a world where a scarcity uh, has to be taken seriously. Obviously, our imagination uh, doesn't have to be run by planetary boundaries, but endless growth in a limited planet uh, is in attention at least uh, with each other. And businesses whose objective is to, um, to be, make uh, the owners on the stock market happy in a quarterly manner are by their nature different 
then the economy, then the businesses we are we have represented here, they have other objectives than just making money. And this is why the social and solidarity economy is an important contribution to the big shift in the way how our economies function. And this is why it's so important that Europe with its common market sets the right framework for just these enterprises to thrive. And therefore, the main objective for me, at least in this hearing, is to listen to you, to learn from you, where is Europe supportive for you? And where is Europe an obstacle? How do we have to do better so that cooperatives, associations, social businesses, foundations uh, have the same chances to, uh, to be on this common market than other companies? And this is why it's so important to learn from you what we should put into the legislation when it comes to the Green Deal on the one hand and on the action plan for the social economy, which we are expecting for next year as well. So please list us your experiences with EU legislation, uh, European institutions, which with member states when they are implementing European law. Give us your examples so that we can help you to change European funding, European legislation. We are a cross-party intergroup we have the potential to organize a space across party lines to help a social and solidarity business to grow. And therefore we need your experience and please share it with us during this seminar in writing later on. And in order for us to be the right framework to be your lobby, so to say, in on the Brussels stage. And this why why we are now in listening mode looking forward uh, to your contributions. And great to see Maya here in this webinar. Thank you very much, Sven. And I think that uh, the social economy community has to be very well aware of the, of the important role of the social economy intergroup to, to defend our interest and to mainstream, to promote the development of the social economy across the European Union. So thanks to all the MEPs that form, to the co-chairs, to the base chairs, and to the more than 80 MEPs that form this, uh, this intergroup, because they are fundamental uh, to promote another way of doing businesses in the European Union. Um, so before the, after that, I will give the floor to the president of Social Economy Europe, Juan Antonio Pedreño, also president of CEPES, who will also talk about the current political situation, how the social economy has a vision to make a green and fair transition in the European Union, and what are our proposals and our main worries in this particular time. Juan Antonio, te doy la palabra. Buenas tardes. <coughs> Buenas tardes. Eh... Estimada Patricia Toyas, Ben Gigol, Mónica Semedo, encantado de, de escuchar con vuestras palabras. Es un honor para mí compartir este evento con todos vosotros y sobre todo más aún porque tenemos eh, varios cientos de personas interesados eh, de Europa y de todos otros lugares del mundo en esta conversación sobre la visión de la economía social para una transición verde y justa. Un saludo muy entrañable también a todas las personas intervinientes en este encuentro con un agradecimiento especial al vicepresidente Timmerman por su compromiso con un mundo más sostenible y con la economía social. Sé que la mayoría de las empresas y las entidades de la economía social, en general todo el conjunto de la economía en nuestras sociedades, estamos atravesando momentos difíciles, tiempos difíciles como consecuencia de la pandemia. Esta es una situación dura que exige a todas las instituciones y gobiernos acertar en las respuestas de manera urgente y a medio plazo a los retos sanitarios, pero también a los retos y a los cambios sociales, educativos, económicos y medioambientales. No debemos perder la esperanza y, por el contrario, ser conscientes de nuestras fortalezas y recursos para encontrar soluciones. Como decía Stephen Hawking, la inteligencia es la habilidad para adaptarse a los cambios. Hoy vamos a poner de manifiesto por qué la economía social es clave para construir un cambio inteligente y conseguir un futuro más sostenible y responsable con nuestro planeta. Como dice mi colega el vicepresidente de Social Economy, Jerome Xavier, la economía es el mañana y lo es por su forma de hacer y por nuestros principios y características únicas. 
Sven ha hecho referencia a algunas de las características especiales de la economía social. Las personas y el planeta primero, siendo la actividad empresarial un medio para mejorar el bienestar colectivo. Democracia, participación, ciudad, participación ciudadana, activismo, una economía descentralizada en red, co, en red, en cooperativa, en la que todas y todos, trabajadores, consumidores, inversores, activistas, muchas veces en cooperación con el sector público, estamos llamados a participar y a colaborar. Y cómo la reinversión de la mayoría de los beneficios se realiza para implementar objetivos de desarrollo sostenible que es otra característica diferencial de las empresas de la economía social. Y sobre todo nuestro carácter fundamentalmente local, iniciativas locales al servicio de las comunidades en las que operan y que forman parte de una red global con una visión común. Por todo esto y por mucho más, los casi 3 millones de empresas y entidades de la economía social y sus 14 millones de empleos son parte de la solución para superar la crisis actual y reconstruir nuestras economías y sociedades de una forma mejor, sin dejar a nadie atrás y combatiendo desafíos existenciales para el ser humano como el cambio climático o la desigualdad. Tenemos ante nosotros un largo camino por recorrer. Quiero aprovechar también para trasladar al Parlamento Europeo y al vicepresidente Timmerman la disposición total de la economía social para ser un aliado y un actor absolutamente comprometido con la respuesta de la Unión Europea a esta grave crisis. En primer lugar, con el Plan Europeo de Recuperación Next Generation y la movilización de 750.000 millones de euros para invertir en la recuperación de nuestras economías, para afrontar las transiciones verde y digital, para modernizar nuestros sistemas de protección social y nuestros estados del bienestar, y para asegurar que ninguna persona pero también ningún territorio se quede al margen de la recuperación y trabajemos por la educación, la adaptación de nuestras competencias en línea con los cambios tecnológicos y del mercado laboral o la modernización de nuestras economías. Una respuesta ha sido esta sin precedentes, ligada a otras como el Pacto Verde Europeo, como Estrategia de Crecimiento de la Unión o el futuro Plan de Acción para la Economía Social, que como ha dicho tanto Sven como Patricia verá la luz en el cuarto trimestre del próximo año. Amigas y amigos de la economía social y del intergrupo de la economía social del Parlamento Europeo, tenemos mucho que hacer en los próximos meses y tenemos la obligación de hacerlo juntos. Este es un desafío que tenemos la obligación de aceptar. Antes de entrar en propuestas concretas, permítame compartir con ustedes una diversidad de historias e iniciativas de economía social, algunas de las cuales desarrollarán nuestros próximos oradores y oradoras, y que muestran cómo y por qué la economía social es clave para la recuperación de nuestras economías. ¿Por qué debe ser la receptora de inversiones y ayudas en el marco del Plan Europeo de Recuperación? ¿Y por qué es el motor hacia una transición verde y justa? Como quizás se ya en Europa hay más de 1.500 cooperativas de energías renovables, Hoy van a estar aquí representadas por su presidente, el presidente de Rescop, Dir Basinjan. Estas cooperativas de energías renovables, llamadas Rescop, agrupan a más de un millón de ciudadanos de toda Europa, comunidades de producción de energía que generan empleo de calidad y progreso local, reinvirtiendo los posibles beneficios en las comunidades donde operan. Porque para alcanzar una transición energética justa, debe permitirse una mayor participación de actores económicos donde los ciudadanos podamos producir juntos nuestra propia energía y asegurar que los beneficios se quedan allí donde ésta se produce, generando desarrollo local, muy especialmente en las zonas rurales y el riesgo de despoblación. Más allá de la producción de energía renovable, muchos de los socios de Rescop también trabajan en proyectos de movilidad sostenible y coche eléctrico compartido, una diversidad de proyectos descentralizados y locales que han sido capaces de desarrollar aplicaciones a escala europea para que el consumidor pueda reservar un coche, por ejemplo, en Gante o en Barcelona o en cualquier otro lugar de Europa. En definitiva, un ejemplo del carácter innovador y local de la economía social y de su apuesta por la intercooperación. Otro ejemplo bien conocido es el de las empresas sociales y otras formas de economía social 
activas en la economía circular, en particular en la reparación, reutilización y reciclaje de recursos demasiado a menudo considerados como desechos. Los socios de Reyus gestionan y dan una segunda vida a más de un millón de toneladas de recursos como aparatos eléctricos y electrodomésticos, textiles, muebles e incluso escombros y materiales de construcción. Reaprovechar recursos y volverlos a incluir en el circuito económico, asegurando una verdadera economía circular, contribuye a generar empleos verdes y oportunidades laborales para personas a menudo en riesgo o en situación de exclusión. Estos son algunos de los nuevos yacimientos de empleo verde, sobre todo para aquellas personas más alejadas del mercado laboral. Las cooperativas de vivienda son otra expresión de acción colectiva frente a desafíos como la escasez de viviendas asequible, especialmente en las grandes ciudades, pero también en el ámbito rural. Un modelo que acumula premios a la sostenibilidad ecológica y energética. Por ejemplo, una cooperativa de Madrid es el único edificio de viviendas de Europa que ha obtenido la certificación LEED Platinum a la máxima excelencia en la construcción sostenible, el respeto medioambiental y la eficiencia energética. Por supuesto, es fundamental el papel de las asociaciones, cooperativas de enseñanza, universidades de la economía social, como Mondragón o Florida, y muchas otras entidades de economía social volcadas en la educación ambiental y en el emprendimiento verde. Sin olvidarnos del papel de las cooperativas agrarias y de consumo, de los circuitos cortos que aseguran el consumo de productos locales y de temporada, así como una remuneración justa para los agricultores o proyectos empresariales altamente innovadores, como el de la cooperativa de trabajo asociado Agresta, una cooperativa que ha ganado recientemente el premio europeo Copernicus Master por el uso de esta tecnología europea para la monitorización de la situación de bosques y montes a través de su proyecto Forest Map, con el objetivo de evitar la reducción o el retroceso de masa forestal, la prevención de incendios o de promover la restauración de la biodiversidad. Y, por supuesto, entidades como las cofradías de pescadores, fuertemente ancladas en el territorio en el que sus socios viven y están comprometidos con una pesca tradicional para preservar la sostenibilidad de nuestros océanos. Estos son solo algunos ejemplos del torrente de innovación social, medioambiental y empresarial que hoy representa a la economía social en Europa. Hoy suponemos el 8% del PIB europeo, pero de lo que no cabe duda es que somos parte fundamental del futuro y vamos a seguir creciendo. Una estrategia adecuada de transición justa permitirá, además, garantizar el mantenimiento del empleo, la creación de actividad en los territorios afectados por la transición energética a través del acompañamiento a sectores y colectivos en riesgo, de modo que contribuya a la fijación de la población y genere nuevas oportunidades. Por tanto, aquí se antoja imprescindible el papel de la economía social. Pero no somos ingenuos y queda mucho camino por recorrer. La economía social es una clara aliada de la Unión Europea, pero tenemos que seguir trabajando por ello. Una clara aliada de los gobiernos nacionales, regionales, locales, en el diseño y en la implementación de planes de recuperación y resiliencia. Hay gobiernos ya, como el Gobierno de España, que ha manifestado claramente su apuesta por la economía social en el destino de los fondos. En todo caso, las urgencias por invertir no pueden traducirse en ausencia de inversión en proyectos de economía social. Debemos intentar que se garanticen inversiones a la altura de la importancia socioeconómica y del carácter altamente innovador de la economía social. Como le transmitimos el pasado 30 de octubre al comisario Smith, para afrontar los retos y transformaciones de nuestra economía, necesitamos invertir en la capacitación de nuestros trabajadores y emprendedores, sin olvidarnos de que en la economía social, capital, trabajo y consumo van habitualmente de la mano. Para ello, desde Social Economy, en el marco del Pacto Europeo para las Competencias que la Comisión presenta hoy mismo, proponemos la puesta en marcha de un partenariado europeo para la mejora de las competencias de los trabajadores y trabajadoras de la economía social. Esperamos que la Comisión tenga en cuenta esta propuesta concreta y que apoye nuestros esfuerzos para facilitar las transformaciones en el ámbito de la economía social. Y, en tercer lugar, y ya citado antes por, los, por Sven y por Patricia, el Plan de Acción para la Economía Social, 
que es una gran esperanza para fomentar la visibilidad de la economía social. Es necesario un trabajo de pedagogía, de apoyo a las administraciones que plantean la puesta en marcha de leyes o políticas en favor de la economía social. Debemos abordar a través de este plan cuestiones, además, como la mejora del acceso de nuestras empresas y entidades a los fondos e instrumentos financieros europeos, en lo que hoy estamos claramente infrarrepresentados. La economía social es el futuro y buena parte de ese futuro nos lo jugamos en los próximos meses. Aprovechemos la oportunidad, trabajemos juntos a escala local y a escala europea para jugar el papel al que estamos llamados en la construcción de una economía más justa, más participativa, democrática, respetuosa con el planeta en el que vivimos y generadora de equidad y cohesión social. Social Economy Euro es la casa común de todos los actores de la economía social y es el instrumento colectivo para la consecución de estos objetivos. Además, contamos con el inestimable apoyo de los 80 eurodiputados que conforman este grupo de economía social, este intergrupo de economía social. Muchísimas gracias a todos los participantes, los comisarios y los que estéis en, este, en, este, en esta audición por vuestro apoyo y por vuestra confianza. El futuro es nuestro. Gracias. Thank you very much, Juan Antonio, for this intervention. Uh, the social economy is tomorrow. The social economy is the future of the economy. And also uh, with problems that have been pointed out uh, in many comments uh, regarding access to EU funds, access to uh, SME policies, access to cohesion policy. How can we structure all this European support to the social economy to make sure um, that we don't have obstacles in accessing EU support? And this is something that, uh, that we have to collectively work to change uh, with the next European Action Plan for the social economy. So thank you very much for the, for the hosts, I mean, for the host of this event, Sven and Patricia, and to Juan Antonio for having delivered uh, uh, these uh, opening remarks. And now we will pass to the first panel on social economy at the forefront of the green and fair transition. So I will ask our speakers in the panel, uh, Dirk Basinjan, Sorcha from uh, president of RISCOP EU that was mentioned uh, by the president, Sorcha Edwards, secretary general of Housing Europe, uh, Bernard Rombeck, president of the Ethical Bank Lanef, Andrea Varanes, vice president of Banca Etica, Julian Cronen, who is already on camera with us, and uh, Benoit Dave and Therese Marie Bouchard to join us to put their cameras on. And I will maybe ask, uh, I will maybe ask, uh, uh, so that's it. I think that we are, we are all there already. And without further ado, I will pass the floor to Dirk Basingen, who is president of RISCOP.EU. Uh, Mr. Basingen, can you present to us, to all the viewers here today, to the 292 viewers uh, with, us, with us today, uh, the movement that you represent as president of RISCOP.EU? What are also your expectations uh, and the expectations of renewable energy co-ops in view of the clean energy for all EU directives? the Green Deal, and the European Action Plan for the Social Economy. By the way, before giving you the floor, uh, uh, Dirk, uh, my colleague Nicholas Clark is providing support to all of you regarding uh, the, some, the little technical issues with interpretation. And just to remind that interpretation, you can find interpretation in the bottom of your, of your screen, right-hand side, and you can press in your favorite language. Uh, Mr. Basinjan, the floor is yours, and thank you for uh, sharing this presentation. Good uh, morning, everyone. Um, I suppose you can see my my presentation now. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Do. Okay. So, uh, what is Rescope EU? It was already mentioned by by, uh, by the president. Um, we are a fairly new federation. It was uh, created at the end of 2013, and we now represent uh, directly or indirectly through federations. Uh, 1,500 uh, citizen energy cooperatives, uh, RESCOP, we call them, and about 1 million uh, citizens. Um, there are, uh, but out there in Europe, there are more than 3,400 uh, as far as we know. So um, we are, uh, since a few years, recognized as a sector organization of Cooperatives Europe, which is the European branch of the International Cooperative Alliance. So um, where are these uh, energy cooperatives situated? Uh, when you put them on the map, and here there are only about 320 who put themselves on, on the European map, you will notice it's more something of Northwestern Europe than of Southern Europe. And especially it's not something of Eastern Europe. Huh? 
So this is one of the big uh, challenges we have as a federation to reach out to Eastern and Europe and the Balkan. So what do we do? Uh, we represent the voice of citizens and citizen energy cooperatives to the European policymakers. We support the startup of new RESCOPs and provide them with tools and contacts. And uh, we provide them with services and uh, we promote the, the, the RESCOP business model throughout Europe, as I said. So um, this is also something uh, which is not widely known, I think is that in most member states, the energy transition is uh, reflected in the, uh, in the tariff, uh, tariffs of households and small enterprises on the low voltage grid. Uh, so this is, these are the figures for Flanders in Belgium. So you see that very large enterprises, they, they are connected to the high voltage grid. They don't contribute at all to the energy transition, whereas the citizens and some very small enterprises, uh, they do. So this is something to take into account. Uh, uh, and uh, this was uh, by the previous commission with their clean energy for all Europeans package, uh, which uh, some uh, directives were a, a consequence of. And they uh, understood. Uh, uh, so they, for the first time, they talked about us not as customers, but as citizens. Uh, and in, when they launched uh, the clean energy package, uh, they, they, uh, they used words as citizens at its core, uh, where citizens take ownership of the energy transition and where vulnerable consumers are protected and are not left behind. And uh, what's also interesting is that in their, all their images, there was a cooperative offshore wind farm of Copenhagen uh, uh, in, in the picture. So, um, in these directives, we got two definitions. Huh? So we, we were uh, we were recognized as as a as a separate uh, entity. Huh? So uh, in in one directive, we are called citizen energy uh, communities, and the other we are called renewable energy communities. And when we won't go into to the details here, but the primary purpose of these energy communities is to provide environmental, economic, and social community benefits for its members or the local areas where, they, where it operates rather than financial profits. What we try to do in our advocacy work is to put in all or most of the cooperative principles into these definitions. And we succeeded quite well, thanks to the European Parliament as well. So actually, we, in, in many countries, we are conceived as a new player huh? and, and, and there is a new uh, game and there's a new playing field. And indeed, we, we, we think that in the future, uh, citizens uh, and communities must become more active and be an active player and not a, 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 a supporter uh, looking at the game between authorities and market players. So um, and we think, uh, and I wrote a, a, a opinion about it, that a resilient EU economy must be built on strong local communities. And that's where the energy transition offers a unique opportunity to take ownership of the production facilities of the future. And we must see to it that the profits, that the, the revenues stay as local as possible, uh, citizens, local communities, municipalities. So uh, what are the benefits? Uh, so the, the revenues, they, they, they stay local and they meet local needs. Uh, uh, it's about ownership, it's about empowerment of citizens and local communities. And so uh, it's also a bit about economic benefits for the participants, but it is also about public acceptance. And so uh, if a wind farm is owned by the people living around, they like it. If it's owned by a big utility, they tend to, to hate it. So um, we have, uh, we have several scientific uh, uh, investigations now, uh, research where it shows that the return to the to local economy is three to eight times higher when uh, the wind turbines, for instance, are owned by the local people. So it's also about uh, what our members do. They, they link technical and social innovation. Huh? So this is a uh, an example from, from the UK, uh, repowering London and Brixton uh, Energy, uh, where, uh, where installations of solar panels are, are combined with, with uh, learning young people, unemployed people, how to install these solar panels. So it's about uh, giving them a, a, 
a, a future uh, job. Um, so, um, how, and how now we, we now have these directives, they now have to be transposed in all member states. In, in uh, like in Eastern Europe, uh, they, they don't really know what it is about. And so we, we as a federation, we, uh, we made a transposition guidance document. Um, it's 100 pages long and yeah, you can find it on our website. And we are now uh, trying to help our members and, and, and sympathetic uh, supporters in all member states uh, with, uh, with the, to have a good transposition and so that all citizens uh, have the same opportunities uh, across the EU as we have had already to a certain extent in Northwestern Europe. Um, there's a lot coming ahead. Huh? So we, as a small young federation, we, we have a lot of work, but we're not alone. We, we have very good contacts with, with the citizen, uh, energy cities, uh, Climate Alliance, uh, ECLE, uh, all kinds of uh, NGOs, uh, environmental NGOs. And uh, we, we are trying to, to do our best. And uh, one of the very recent publications is a very interesting guide, how to set up a, a, an energy community. You can also find it on our website on, on, or on the website of Friends of the Earth Europe. Um, and uh, we hope that in April, late April, uh, there will be a vaccine, vaccine and we will be able to travel to Copenhagen by train and have a, a big meeting in, uh, together with the city of Copenhagen on uh, citizen energy communities. Um, and this is my last slide. That's how our movement grows. We follow the strawberry model. Uh, so a strawberry plant has sprouts and the mother plant helps the young plant until it has uh, roots and can grow itself. And then on its turn can have sprouts and cover the whole forest or the whole field with strawberries, with energy cooperatives. Thank you very much. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Thanks a lot, Dirk. Uh, I think that this is precisely the it, it is a, the story of uh, of renewable the reality of renewable energy co-ops is extremely interesting and it's about the added value of the social economy. The green transition is something that is going to happen anyway uh, that we know today uh, because it is a huge need. Uh, the transition towards renewable energies is going to happen too, but the how is very important and how social economy and co-ops as a strong part as a pillar of the social economy do those things matters. Social economy does it on a democratic way, on a participative way, on an inclusive way. So this is the DNA of the social economy. This is what the social economy brings to the green transition. And that's why also it's so important to make sure uh, that we also, that we are not, uh, that we are not excluded uh, from instance from the recovery effort. So thanks a lot, Dirk. I also said it yesterday to you also for the excellent work that together with your team you do at RISCOP and in cooperation, of course, with the colleagues of Cooperatives Europe. Uh, going beyond representing and producing tools for your members, uh, tools for member states to transpose the directive and to, uh, to promote this movement of uh, renewable energy co-ops. Uh, without further ado, I will pass the floor to Sorta Edwards. Uh, she is Secretary General of Housing Europe, uh, the European Federation of Public Co-op and Social House Housing uh, that uh, manages 25 million these, these actors. Uh, public, cooperative, and social housing providers manage 25 million homes in the European Union. And also, we are very well aware, aware of the enormous floor of, uh, flow of social, ecological innovation that comes from housing co-ops, uh, from social housing providers, etc. Can you explain to us, Sorta, uh, to, our view, to our viewers, uh, why these operators are at the core of the European Green Deal? And what are your expectations regarding Europe's recovery plan? and particularly uh, the renovation wave uh, that the European Recovery Plan is trying to promote, and also your expectations regarding uh, the European, the upcoming European Action Plan for the Social Economy that, as was said before, will be released in the fourth, uh, in the fourth trimester of 2021. Sorta, the floor is yours. I don't think we can see you. Uh, we don't see your video, but we see your presentation. Ah, yes. And can you hear me okay? We hear you very well. Oh, perfect. Yes. 
Sorry about that. Uh, there's something wrong with the camera. It's really an honor for me to be joining this conference today, the, the Social Economy's vision for a green and fair transition, and to share a little bit the perspective from the public cooperative and social housing sector in Europe. So I want to um, go through quite quickly to, so to make sure I cover the questions that you have um, you've put on the table. And, um, and always, as always, really great to be presenting alongside Dirk. I find the work that, uh, that ResCoop are doing on the ground around Europe, making this uh, an energy transition for the people um, and of the people is really, really inspirational. So just a little bit about the, the figures about what is housing Europe and, and where we fit in, in the social economy. So we um, um, amount on the ground to about 43,000 local housing providers. These are different types. These can be um, cooperatives, uh, cooperative housing providers. Um, the cooperatives also have different types in that some are ownership and some are rental. Um, there are also public housing providers um, owned by the city and many um, lim limited and nonprofit um, housing associations. Um, it's about 25 million dwellings. And in total, they are providing around 200,000 new dwellings each year and refurbishing each year also about the equivalent amount. So investing approximately 50 billion and aiming to spend um, 35 billion for new build and 23 billion for renovation and maintenance um, every year for the next 10 years. So I must actually stress that these figures are actually coming from a study that we did at the start of this year. So we don't have yet that feedback um, after COVID and the impact of COVID as having on the non-for-profit sector in housing. But what our ambition is, and indeed we had a conference today with the uh, United Nations and we've put our ambition on the table that we um, want to, if we can stick to our forecast, we can renovate 4 million homes by 2030. And in doing that, we can bring um, uh, by 2050, 2050, bring those homes, uh, 50 million homes, up to an average of level B. And this obviously will be contributing to the decarbonization of the building stock, to a CO2, to CO2 neutral Europe. Um, but to do this, we would need to hit, hit that 200,000 unit per year target. And we would need for that an extra, extra 10 billion per year until 2050. So that's again to give you a picture of where we fit in um, in um, the in the housing sector and also within the social economy. So there's a diversity there. There's social housing, typically rental housing below market prices, affordable housing, typically below or closer to market rents, and cooperative housing owned and managed by resident groups or nonprofit organisations. A huge diversity there across Europe and in different cities. You can see that in Austria. We have 24% of the stock in those limited profit housing cooperatives. In Ireland, 9%, for instance, in housing associations. Netherlands, 30%. Um, Spain, closer to three, but growing fast. And um, so why is renovating? I mean, I think we, we, these arguments are clear and we heard them also from did it. Um, why this investment in local people in, in providing better quality of living for local communities and for local homes and part of that being social housing. Why is it so key for the recovery? Obviously, we have to see this investment. This is an investment and not a cost. The return comes back in, in terms of taxes, in terms of job creation. Money circulates in the local economy instead of being used to import fuel, build more power stations. And obviously this reducing bills for people means more, again, more money being spent in the local economy. And inclusivity. I mean, we've heard Executive Vice President Timmermans say a number of times, we won't have an energy transition unless everybody in, is involved. So this is a way to getting those people who are at the, at the lowest and middle income um, levels in our communities on board for the energy transition. So if we can get those on board, I think it gives us a, a clear di uh, directory for including everybody. Also, the fact that the sector has those um, 50 million homes, they can really test and upscale cost optimal approaches to use across their built environment. Um, often, also what we see is that when um, um, social economy actors are leading the energy transition, this is not just about insulation centimeters and solar PV panels. 
while that is important, this is about turning neighborhoods into places where people can be proud to live and bringing all of the, the community along with that together um, and bringing also the mix of tenure. So this is an energy transition that turns neighborhoods around, not only coming in, adding that insulation and moving on, but looking at local jobs and local economy. Um, and obviously we see that if um, the Europe has the highest proportion of housing within the social economy, within the non-for-profit sector, and can lead, lead the way globally in, in, in cracking this nut. Just a couple of slides of the type of, on, of, the type of projects that we're talking about here. Um, so we have just some results on the CO2 impact when we looked at a, a district in Potsdam, when we looked at the social housing neighborhood together with the, the district heating and the supply side. And um, there we see that in total, you're bringing down the costs for people at the same time, you're reducing the carbon impact and um, um, you're having perhaps not A plus homes, but you're having um, a high comfort and quality homes, um, but with the supply side figured in. Then an example from Bordeaux, an example of the type of projects also Dirk is working to promote self-consumption in local social housing in Bordeaux. And here is an example of the um, more holistic approach. This is an example from one of the, the, the um, public housing providers in Sweden that worked together with all of the social economy actors um, there in, um, in what was a no-go area. So working together with schools, working with um, and the local agencies, public agencies on crime prevention. So it was an area which was really classified as a risk area with gangs, with insecure outdoor environment and um, bad reputation. And so the part of this was obviously bringing people's homes up to a higher standards. And there you see a nice example where we, the, the housing provider actually built an extra layer on top of the existing building, an extra floor. And this floor also, this new um, accommodation help to cover the costs of the renovation of the building and keep rents affordable. And so you've asked a, a key question about the, um, the recovery um, package and how we can make sure that this reaches local projects on the ground. I think a key part of that, um, Victoria, is going to be aggregators, the role of aggregators. And we see a really good example coming through from France. They brought together a central aggregator with the, with the um, National Federation of Housing Providers coming together with the Council of Europe Development Bank, with the EIB and with the Bank des Territoires there in, um, in France. And this can really act as a good aggregator also to bring through structural funds, um, ERDF, and to bring through um, help to, to bring through recovery um, fund. Because what we see at the moment is that there is um, a need to make sure to do that extra work, um, to make sure that um, our national governments are not simply using recovery funds to cover up holes in the budget left by COVID, but that they are really reaching those um, projects on the ground that can lead us to the energy transition we need. Here we see another good example from social housing providers in Flanders. They are rolling out um, PV across the region and putting together with the help of the EIB a, um, a special a special purpose vehicle for that to bring down people's bills. Also, we see in Dutch the power of aggregation, the Dutch climate pack, where social housing providers are seen as the engine of the energy transition and the engine of an energy transition that is neutral in cost for tenants. So this is the real challenge that we're facing. And this cost, this um, um, project is a real challenge. It's not going to be neutral cost for the housing providers themselves, but the their work is to make sure that it we're not resulting in higher rents for, for people living in those homes. So a quick um, overview of what we expect from the Green Deal, the renovation waves and the risk and opportunities and some questions. So we do have some worries about the mandatory energy requirements and the risk of increased standards without compensation. Um, so the, the question about whether the recovery and resilience plan will really deliver that finance that is needed is still an open question. And if we have those mandatory energy requirements and without the necessary funding, this is obviously going to result in a compromised position for social housing providers who have to deliver their core task. So that is provide affordable housing in the middle of a housing crisis. And we must remember in many big cities. 
Uh, what we do very much welcome is the new affordable housing initiative to support social housing project renovation. And there, I think the key word is livability. We see a recognition in the renovation wave on the need for this um, energy transition to promote livability. Um, and also to use technology to do that. So that was one of the initiatives we very much welcome coming through in the renovation wave, which we'll be working and helping to shape over the next um, months uh, or year or so. Um, we also saw focus on potential for bringing in new technologies and um, for example, prefabrication of solutions to speed up the work. Um, we see that those projects um, that should be part of the energy transition they should be shovel ready. And this, I think we can really guarantee within the social housing sector. They should guarantee affordable living costs. They should guarantee um, work together with, ten with tenants to address social problems, vulnerable communities, and produce measurable reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. So we should be looking at projects that um, improve the environmental impact, but at the same time, do not harm um, social inclusion, but actually improve social inclusion. And there is a website where we've put some of the examples of um, how we see that the social and green solutions to, to renovate Europe in our housing evolution site as part of our campaign, Our Homes Are Deal. Thank you very much. I hope we didn't take too long. Thank you very much, Sorcha. I think that it was uh, perfect in terms of time and also uh, extremely interesting uh, to see how uh, can can we try yes. to yeah thanks a lot I'm going to try to stop here. thank you very much and also extremely interesting how citizens and uh and the public sector and uh, can act uh to bring solutions to the to the scarcity of uh of housing in cities and also to the renovation uh that the housing has to has to undertake uh to meet uh to meet the criteria and the objectives so thank you very much for this very comprehensive for this very comprehensive presentation now we will pass the floor to Bernard Rambeck. Uh, before doing that, I will. I, I always try to remind that we have some questions in the Q and A. Um, if uh, if panelists allow, and I am sure they will, just for all of you to know, to all our uh, 296 participants, all the presentations will be made available uh, at the end of this uh, of this event, including a report on uh, on the full event so that will be available and some of your questions will also be uh, if time allows we will also transfer some of your questions uh, to the relevant speakers before the end of the before the end of the session and now yes i will share i will give the floor to bernard Rombeck, who is a uh, president of lanef uh, an ethical bank in france which is member of febea um, i will switch to french to give him the word bernard uh, Bernard has a special relation, I will say, with Social Economy Europe because uh, il était président de, de FEBA lorsque FEBA est rentré à Social Economy Europe. Uh, donc, c'est une, une personne qui a été importante pour le mouvement de l'économie sociale européenne et pour les interconnexions uh, entre le mouvement des finances éthiques et l'économie sociale. Donc, Bernard, la question est, quelle est la valeur ajoutée apportée par les banques éthiques aux organisations de l'économie sociale et à leur rôle uh, dans le cadre des transitions uh, juste, verte et digitale. Bernard, the floor is yours. Bonjour et, et merci euh, de cette question. Je, je voudrais d'abord vous dire que la FEBA, elle rassemble aujourd'hui, c'est la Fédération européenne des banques éthiques et alternatives, et elle rassemble en Europe, en fait, les initiatives des banques éthiques nées dans nos différents pays, il y a une quinzaine de pays représentés pour fédérer des citoyens qui sont soucieux que leur argent serve à des finalités utiles au bien commun et à l'amélioration de la société. La plupart de ces banques éthiques sont elles-mêmes des entreprises d'économie sociale, d'où évidemment notre participation active à, à ce séminaire, bien sûr, et notre introduction dans Social Economy Europe. Mais... Euh, mais chacune aussi, elle finance dans son pays l'économie sociale et solidaire, et je dirais même qu'elle a accompagné son important développement de ces dernières années, voire dernières décennies. Pour ma part, je suis président du directoire de la NEF, une banque éthique française qui, depuis plus de 30 ans, récolte de l'épargne citoyenne pour l'utiliser en crédit auprès de l'économie sociale et solidaire et de tout projet qui participe de l'amélioration de la société dans trois grands domaines, l'environnemental, le social et la culture. Et en réalité, à partir du moment où on est dans ces domaines-là, on touche à tous les pans de l'économie, 
pourvu qu'on y mette cette volonté d'aller dans la dimension environnementale de justice sociale ou qu'on soit dans, la domaine, dans le domaine culturel. Alors, en tant que représentant des, des banques éthiques, nous avons pris une habitude par ailleurs excellente, je trouve, qui est de, quand on se présente, de défendre d'abord et de promouvoir nos clients. Nous sommes, nous, des intermédiaires entre des épargnants et des gens qui ont des projets porteurs de sens et porteurs d'évolution sociétale. Et donc, nous, euh, nous, nous, nous prenons nos clients très souvent pour bien montrer l'évolution de la société dans laquelle on se situe. Euh, Aujourd'hui, pourtant, je dois aussi attirer votre attention sur la gestion politique du monde financier et du statut des banques éthiques qui font pleinement partie du monde de l'économie sociale. Les banques éthiques ont traversé la crise financière de 2008 sans problème. Alors qu'un peu partout, les difficultés étaient énormes dans le monde financier, du côté de la FEBA, tous nos membres ont pu traverser cette période en toute sérénité. Pourquoi Parce que les fondamentaux, comme la transparence dans la gestion de l'argent, le refus de la spéculation et l'investissement dans l'économie réelle, ces trois piliers-là correspondent en fait à ce qui a fait cette crise de 2008 et nous a permis de rester à l'abri de cette crise de la folie financière. Les banques éthiques y ont gagné une reconnaissance par les citoyens, devenus plus vigilants sur ce qu'on fait de leur argent et sensibilisés au bien commun et à leur utilité. Par contre, les banques éthiques ont perdu l'après-crise sur le terrain politique. Après la crise, les autorités ont voulu, et à raison, hein, renforcer les règles, développer le, les pouvoirs des régulateurs. Le problème, c'est que les politiques ont dès lors abandonné le terrain de la finance pour la laisser se faire réguler par des techniciens le plus souvent très brillants, et qui ont pris à cœur la question de la sécurité. Mais petit à petit, dans nos pays européens, on a favorisé ou obligé des regroupements, des fusions, des adossements, qui regroupent les banques dans de grands groupes. Euh, C'est devenu même presque indispensable d'être dans un grand groupe pour pouvoir répondre à l'inflation réglementaire. Il est en effet plus facile de réguler quelques grands groupes que des centaines ou des milliers de petites banques. « Too big to fail », disait-on en 2008. Cette phrase prononcée à l'époque comme une alerte est devenue paradoxalement aujourd'hui un objectif. Mais un objectif qui n'est pas sans danger. Cette réglementation s'est faite en dehors de toute différenciation sur le statut et les objectifs des organisations. Et les banques éthiques croulent aujourd'hui sous des obligations de plus en plus éloignées de leurs objectifs. Avec comme résultat la quasi-impossibilité de créer aujourd'hui une banque éthique en Europe, avec la difficulté pour celles qui existent de pouvoir encore se développer autour d'un projet sociétal, quelle banque peut encore aujourd'hui, par exemple, consacrer son énergie à des microcrédits autrement que par un volontarisme quasi-suicidaire parce qu'il est évident que c'est une perte d'argent assurée que nous, la plupart des banques éthiques, continuons à essayer de faire, malgré ce que cela implique sur notre euh, existence. Et puis, on voit aussi l'obligation de plus en plus prononcée des régulateurs de ne faire rentrer dans les conseils d'administration que des banquiers avertis, au mépris, à mon sens, de la représentation des clients et de la société civile, au profit peut-être d'un entre-soi bancaire dont on connaît pourtant les risques. Et pour nous, banque éthique, c'est très important de rester dans cette ouverture et cette capacité de recevoir la société au sein des banques. Bien sûr, il faut des spécialistes, mais pas que. Il faut que la société soit présente. Mesdames et messieurs les parlementaires, au moment où cette crise du Covid-19 nous permet de renverser les idées toutes faites du monde hier, de mobiliser des moyens financiers considérables, je voudrais attirer votre attention sur la nécessité de bénéficier en Europe d'une finance éthique consacrée au bien commun, levier financier et partenaire naturel d'un projet politique environnementalement performant et un projet politique socialement plus juste. Nous sommes des partenaires évidents de ce projet-là. Cette finance, elle est là, elle existe, grâce au soutien de millions de citoyens, et elle doit aujourd'hui, avec la crise du Covid et toutes les implications économiques, elle doit changer d'échelle pour affronter cette crise. 
Mais ça, ce ne sera pas possible sans un réveil politique sur la finance, sans une alliance entre les banques éthiques et les politiques pour leur donner la place qu'elles sont prêtes à prendre pour participer du redressement économique indispensable dans lequel on va se retrouver et qui puisse faire face aux enjeux environnementaux et climatiques euh, <coughs> évidents. Aussi, j'ai de mon côté cinq propositions à vous faire. Une première proposition, c'est de revoir les règles du RGEC, le Règlement Général d'Exception par Catégorie. Cette révision représenterait une véritable opportunité de reconnaître la spécificité des entreprises sociales, pas seulement financières d'ailleurs, mais en particulier aussi financières, et de favoriser leur financement et donc leur développement. Ce règlement aujourd'hui considère les entreprises sociales comme des PME lucratives classiques. Or, ce règlement est essentiel dans les politiques concurrentielles, et donc pour pouvoir travailler avec des pouvoirs publics ou bénéficier de certains avantages de par la nature des entreprises sociales, eh bien, il y a la nécessité de, de reconsidérer ce règlement. Parce que, en considérant les entreprises sociales comme des PME lucratives, euh, ce règlement détruit les avantages fiscaux dont on a pu bénéficier en France et dans d'autres pays, et qui a disparu là cette année, sur les, la capitalisation. Or, on est au moment où on insiste auprès des banques pour qu'elles euh, aient toujours plus de fonds propres, via notamment le mécanisme du ratio de solvabilité, et au moment même où on a cette insistance, pour des banques qui sont coopératives et éthiques, la nécessité c'est que ce soit citoyenne, on sait qu'il n'y a pas de distribution de dividendes, ou quasiment pas, et on retire les avantages possibles. La croissance des fonds propres, elle ne posera pas de problème aux grands groupes classiques. Ils n'auront aucun problème. Mais là où les banques éthiques, par contre, risquent à un certain moment de devoir ralentir la production de crédits durables. Ça veut dire que potentiellement, les, les, les pots de banane qu'on glisse sur le chemin des banques éthiques sont, peuvent avoir un impact fort sur le développement de l'économie sociale dont nous sommes un des leviers essentiels. Je tiens à ce propos à, à votre disposition un mémo sur la révision du FGEC qui a été réalisé par Financeul et qui est très instructif sur le sujet. Deuxième proposition, revoir les règles du calcul de, de ce fameux ratio de solvabilité en le pondérant de façon positive sur les investissements durables. Ce calcul est assez complexe et je ne vais pas vous en faire le détail, mais si on avait une pondération favorable aux investissements durables, ça aurait un impact environnemental, pas seulement d'ailleurs pour les banques éthiques, mais sur l'ensemble du monde bancaire. Et ça pourrait même être un incitant pour aller vers de l'impact environnemental et de diminuer les crédits carbonés. Et un impact aussi sur l'économie sociale, qui est un des pionniers en matière environnementale et qui, à ce titre, pourrait avoir beaucoup plus de facilité à se développer, à prendre la place dont il a besoin aujourd'hui. Troisième proposition, c'est de rendre cette réglementation bancaire adaptée et favorable au principe du monde coopératif et à la pérennité de banques à taille humaine qui sont le seul espoir d'innovation et de créativité. Quatrième proposition, c'est de soutenir le Fonds européen d'investissement. Or, il faut dire aussi tout ce qui fonctionne bien. Et le Fonds européen d'investissement est un excellent outil européen qui a pu prendre le temps de comprendre et de travailler efficacement avec les banques éthiques, notamment dans son travail avec la DG Emploi sur la microfinance et, et les garanties également pour l'entrepreneuriat social. On a là un outil qui a appris au fur et à mesure des années à connaître la banque éthique, à connaître son rôle dans le financement de l'économie sociale. Et je pense qu'il y a quelque chose à soigner autour de ça, parce que ce n'est pas toujours si évident de pouvoir construire des outils qui arrivent à avoir cette proximité avec la dimension citoyenne qui se trouve derrière les banques éthiques. Cinquième proposition, et ce n'est certainement pas la dernière qu'on pourra vous faire à l'avenir, c'est de doter les banques éthiques d'un statut particulier qui puissent leur éviter de subir les conséquences de règles qui ne les concernent pas et de pouvoir pleinement jouer leur rôle sociétal. Aujourd'hui, le risque est de voir nos banques éthiques devoir s'associer à des banques qui ne le sont pas et de perdre leur autonomie de gestion. Il n'y aura plus de banque éthique sans une autonomie de gestion. Il faut savoir que ce mouvement de regroupement 
signifie l'abandon de la finance éthique et de laisser la finance classique prendre toute la place. C'est aussi prendre le risque qu'on ne soit noyé dans les années qui viennent sous des fintechs prétendument éthiques qui vont nous faire croire à un monde plus vert, mais en s'appuyant sur des modèles qui échappent à toute régulation, parce qu'ils pourront construire ce qui va échapper à ce monde régulatoire, et qui vont s'articuler sur des banques qui, elles, on seront on ne peut moins vertes. Alors, je vous ai fait là un long descriptif des banques éthiques, mais pour répondre aussi à la, à la question, il faut aussi savoir que les banques éthiques, dans leur travail avec l'économie sociale, elles sont dans une logique tout à fait différente de, des banques classiques. Pourquoi Parce qu'en fait, on n'est pas là pour produire du crédit. On est là pour travailler en partenariat. Nous sommes dans une visée d'impact. Ça veut dire que si le projet qu'on finance ne réussit pas, pleinement et dans son impact et dans ce qu'il doit agir sur la société, eh bien nous, on rate notre objectif. Crédit remboursé ou pas, ce n'est pas, pas ça la logique. La logique, c'est que ce crédit serve à participer à une amélioration. Et la meilleure solution là-dessus, c'est d'être dans une logique coopérative, partenariale, et de bien voir le projet <coughs> comme étant une, une réussite indispensable pour que notre impact à nous soit aussi positif. À la NEF, on a pris d'ailleurs le modèle de, de la banque éthique dont on va parler tout à l'heure, celle de banquiers itinérants, c'est-à-dire de banquiers qui vont vers les clients. On ne fonctionne pas avec des agences où on reçoit, non, on va vers les gens, on va connaître les projets. Les, les... On est dans les banques éthiques avec une capacité d'aller vers l'innovation, de comprendre ce monde de l'économie sociale. Sachez que quand la bio a commencé à exister, il n'y avait qu'un seul type de financier pour soutenir les transformations en agriculture bio, c'était les, les banquiers éthiques. Quand l'énergie renouvelable a commencé à émerger, c'est les banquiers éthiques qui étaient là. Après, on voit le monde financier revenir et venir là où il y a de l'argent éventuellement qui peut se faire. On peut continuer, hein, le recyclage, c'est la même chose, les circuits courts, on est dans la même logique. Qui peut aujourd'hui comprendre le fonctionnement des associations et des coopératives Eh bien, ce sont les, les banques éthiques, leurs 700 000 clients et leurs 30 milliards d'euros qu'elles représentent aujourd'hui. Nous avons là un secteur précieux, unique, qui est né dans nos différents pays avec des véritables logiques de circuits courts financiers et de besoins sociétaux. Mon appel est à ce qu'on puisse continuer à permettre à cette finance de se développer et surtout de lui donner les moyens d'agir au moment où on a tous besoin d'une finance comme celle-là. Merci de votre attention. Merci beaucoup Bernard. Thank you very much for all these uh, for this defense of the role of ethical banks as key supporters and and the wider social economic community because we have also received some comments. Uh, Uh, from different participants. Uh, so ethical banks is one of the pillars. Also, of course, the larger uh, community of cooperative banks, etc., which are key financiers of the social economy that come from the social economy movement, that understand the social economy movement and that are at the service of the social economy. So we're first financier, uh, the first financial actors that came, uh, that came from us, and indeed, which are very special, which do not only uh, provide financial support but also capacity building, which very well understand the needs of our enterprises and that incorporate social economy experts and social economy practitioners, which is in their governance, which is important for ethical banks and also for EU funds and instruments. Huh? Uh, when we have EU funds and instruments that want to promote social economy, we also need people that understand the needs and the particularities the particular governance, the system of redistribution of uh, reinvestment of profits of the social economy. So indeed, a very, an extremely interesting, uh, an extremely interesting uh, uh, speech, which, all, which also very good proposals on, on reforming the general block exemption regulation or, uh, or introducing a, a support factor for sustainable investment or for social investments. Thank you very much, Bernard. And now we will give the floor to your colleague, Andrea Varanes, who is vice president of another very well-known ethical bank institution, Banca Etica in Italy. And the question for you, Andrea, will be, from the point of view of ethical banks, can EU sustainable finance agenda be a valid tool to promote the environmental and social transition? And how? How can this agenda support you? Yes. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. And I will take on from where Bernard left, just adding a few things he already said. Uh, a lot on how 
uh, FEBEA members are not only support the social economy, they are part of social economy and their role is to evaluate the social and the environmental impacts of all their uh, loan and, uh, and investing and how we are worried by this uh, one size fits all approach to regulation that it, too often we see on, on financial matters. And uh, regarding the, the, the sustainable finance agenda, we think it is an essential tool in order to give us the, the, the chance to better sustain and promote uh, the social economy. We uh, fully share uh, the, the concerns of the, um, on the environmental impacts of the financial activities and we welcome the path that has been taken by the Commission and the financial and the European institutions on the role that the financial sector could and should play uh, in the fight against uh, climate change. That's why we welcome the green taxonomy on sustainable activities and all that has been done so far. Uh, this said, we also strongly believe that sustainability is a much broader concept and uh, it must go beyond environment and climate change. As much as it's urgent and important, sustainability must take into account all the social uh, dimension, all the governance dimension. Uh, uh, even further, we are really worried to see that so far in the European Union approach, there's hardly any mention to speculation in defining sustainable finance. Uh, we wonder how it's possible just a dozen years after the subprime crisis and the Lehman Brothers collapse and all that happened to define sustainable finance without ever mentioning tax havens, the problem with derivatives, the instability of financial markets, uh, the shadow banking system, and so on and so forth. Uh, as Ven was saying in the introduction, even if we only wanted to look at the environmental impacts, uh, so far the short termism of the current financial system is probably the main driver that pushes companies to ignore any environmental evaluation and just to focus on the maximization of their shares as their only goal on a daily basis on the short term. Uh, even regarding the environmental approach in the sustainable finance agenda, uh, so far we miss the definition of what is unsustainable. It's great to have a green taxonomy, but we need criteria as strict as possible. We need to have a taxonomy of polluting activities, unsustainable activities, uh, as much as we need the social taxonomy in order to really allow finance to shift and to have a uh, an impact on the, on the fight against climate change and for, uh, for social issues. Uh, that's why we welcome the sustainable finance agenda, but we believe what has been done so far uh, must be seen as a first step on a long journey and it, we have to go further on uh, social taxonomy together we're talking about transparency together we're talking about a lot of other issues uh, otherwise we will once again have this one side fits all approach we'll have the risk of greenwashing from the main financial groups and so on and so forth uh, let me just point out an example that Bernard, Bernard was quickly mentioning uh, one of the most important tools we could imagine in order to foster green economy and social economy would be what we call a social or green supporting factor. If I explain in a nutshell, uh, so far banks capital requirements for any loan they provide, they are based only on the financial risk of the loan. Uh, taking into account the overall environmental and social impact of a loan uh, would mean lowering capital requirements for loans with positive impacts on the environment and the society and possibly raising them for unsustainable projects for polluting projects. This would mean cheaper uh, credit, cheaper loans for green and social economy and it would be uh, an extraordinary tool in order to foster green and social uh, economy towards circular economy towards sustainability. Uh, what is the main problem? The main problem lies in the definition of what, how we define green and social finance. Because if the, uh, if the criteria for defining what is sustainable finance are too weak, too diluted, then any green social factor would only be uh, a kind of loophole for the big banks to promote business as usual and to 
uh, somehow avoid the capital requirement rules that were put in place after the 2007, 2008 uh, subprime crisis and the crisis that follow. This is one example to show why we need strong and clear criteria to define green, social, sustainable finance. Uh, let me conclude by saying an instrument like a, a green or social supporting factor would be an exceptional tool in order to foster and promote green and social economy. And in a time of difficult uh, period for, for, for public budget, it would be a measure, a measure at zero cost for public budgets. But we need a strong, strong definition and strong criteria. And we need to really specify what do we mean by ethical banking, sustainable finance, and so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, we are available. would be more than happy to, to give a help as we may uh, in, in following up in this discussion and see if and how these tools can be implemented in the coming future. Thanks a lot for your attention and once again for inviting us. Thanks a lot, Andrea, for your presentation. Very interesting. Uh, just a couple of reminders. First of all, we are a bit ahead of time. Uh, so I will ask, I will unfortunately at time flies, presentations are extremely interesting. Uh, so I will ask the next speakers to, uh, to stick to six minutes, if possible, uh, if possible, even a bit less, uh, to make sure that we can uh, end on time and also uh, not take too much energy from our, uh, from our magnificent team of translators that we have with us today. Um, Regarding ethical finance, I will just just one very quick reaction. Uh, first, first message that I keep from both interventions, from Andrea and from Bernard, there is an SOS, regulation matters. We need to protect and to promote through regulation this type of uh, business models, cooperative banks, ethical alternative banks, credit unions, the diversity of social economy financiers needs to be protected and recognized uh, in, EU, in EU legislation. And... Uh, and, uh, and also concrete instruments and concrete instruments that do not need investments from the public sectors, such as this support factor for social investments that Andrea was defending. Uh, so very interesting. Uh, looking forward to continue working together and, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, to continue, to continue this conversation. Um, just one additional thing also before uh, passing the floor to the next speaker, you can, all of you, uh, these uh, 280 people that are with us today, you can join also the conversation in the social media uh, using the hashtag SE, Social Economy for Green Transition. Uh, so after this, uh, this uh, short publicity, happy to give the floor to our colleague, Julian Krunen. Uh, Julian is the founder and managing director of Innatura, a social economy company, a charity uh, in the circular economy. Um, I mean, she's a, she has been a researcher, but also uh, a strong practitioner, a strong activist in the social economy sector. And my question to her will be the following. Uh, Mrs. Schroeder, what happens in the European Union to un unused resources, such as surplus products uh, in the European Union? Pro surplus products are not sold anymore uh, by their productors. How can we give products a second life uh, while benefiting charities and the whole social economy community? And... Uh, what are your expectations regarding the upcoming European Action Plan for the social economy? Julian, the floor is yours, and thank you very much, like for all the to all the other speakers for being with us today in this uh, in this amazing event. Yeah, thank you very much for the invitation, and I try to rush through that. Um, well, unfortunately, a lot of consumer products are being disposed of every single day for a number of reasons: um, production faults, seasonal articles, relaunch articles, um, and classic overstock. That means absolutely brand new products which don't have any fault, which are perfectly usable um, returns. There's a whole lot of reasons for that. And uh, we know that about two to 3% of consumer products fall out of the production uh, of the value chain. That means for Germany alone, uh, that makes up a market value of 7 billion euro per year of consumer goods, which are just being destroyed. And about a third of that is perfectly usable. Um, disposing of those products is absolutely the wrong thing to do, both for social and en environmental reasons. So why not take those products and basically distribute them into the social sector? Um, that would increase our resource uh, efficiency. Uh, we would be able to close the loop a little bit, at least using things as they were intended to, um, and to create social benefits. And that is exactly what Inatura does. We are, as you said, a social enterprise. We're located in Cologne, Germany and we cater to virtually all charities in Germany. Uh, what we do is we collect those brand new consumer products from manufacturers and retailers. 
uh, bring them into our warehouse, put them on the catalog, and charities can order from a digital catalog. They pay a handling fee between 5 and 20% of the market value, which helps us to cover part of our cost. Um, and the, the reason how we, uh, how do you create social benefit with receiving those donated products? Um, charities can expand their, the mileage of their budget. Um, they save money and can basically um, safeguard or actually expand their activities. They can add beds in a shelter. They can um, have counseling uh, centers open longer. They are able to afford organic food. And last but not least, giving brand new products um, means for the beneficiary means dignity and social participation. That, that's very, very important. Um, so we basically systematically transform a waste problem into a solution. And we basically give the uh, neg negative side of the coin that there is always surplus because we always want to have a choice of everything anytime. We give it a positive side again. So that's what we do. We do that within the in-kind direct international network um, with affiliates in France, the UK, Italy, Singapore, actually, and more to come under the patronage of uh, the Prince of Wales. And we share best practice and, and donations and advocate product philanthropy, as we call that. We are a typical social enterprise in the sense that the two societal issues we are addressing, waste and social need, uh, wouldn't be tackled by the government alone, wouldn't be tackled by uh, charity, uh, by uh, for-profit companies alone. Um, and from the beginning, we have defined clear metrics um, for the social and environmental impact. Just to give you a rough idea where we are in terms of numbers since we started operations in 2013, uh, we have distributed uh, goods worth 20 million euros. So if you think about the 7 billion per year and the 2 billion usable, we're just scratching on the surface of, I always say, the first snowflake of the iceberg. Uh, so the potential is, is enormous. Uh, we have about 5,000 charities registered with us uh, so they can order from us. We have about uh, 150 donor companies and we have avoided something like 3,000 tons of waste. Overall in the network, we've distributed together uh, almost 600 million a euro worth, uh, worth of goods. We have about 15,000 charities which could help their beneficiaries and about 1,500 donor companies. Um, we're contributing to the SDGs 12 and 13 mainly, but also of course the work helps charities to reduce poverty. Now, um, I know I have to rush, so uh, let me cut um, down to three proposals. The first thing is I think we simply have to facilitate and encourage product philanthropy and communicate its importance. And I know that in the social economy Europe plan, uh, there are clear objectives to improve the visibility also of business models like ours. So I absolutely support that. It's very important. Uh, the second thing is we def definitely have to improve the funding of social enterprises. We, but we've also heard about that. You have identified that. And let me just make one remark. Every day there are tremendous ideas being shaped how to tackle societal issues of real relevance about sustainability, about the growing age in our communities or in our societies, but they're simply not being implemented because the funding is not there. Um, and there's critical, there's empirical proof that social enterprises are more resilient and more successful. We've seen that in the Corona crisis, they are, part of the solution. They are driving the social innovation. So I absolutely would like to, uh, to endorse this uh, objective to, to improve that. But last but not least, the most important thing for our topic is that we create uh, and harmonize the taxation rules for in-kind donations within the EU and fix the disincentives we currently have. Actually, it's more, uh, more um, expensive for most companies to donate than to dispose of things. Because in Germany, for example, you have to account for a donation as revenues, which means you have to pay VAT. And even a donation receipt cannot offset that. And when we go to the financial authorities here, we're always being referred to Brussels. They cannot make a VAT exempt because that's the rule according to the EU VAT directive. Um, there is no differentiation whether you give goods to a charity or a private person or a company. And if it's more expensive for companies to donate than to dispose of, 
uh, companies unfortunately decide in a majority for disposal. This is something we cannot afford. Um, and Corona times have made very clear there is a need for in-kind donations. Charities had trouble to do fundraising. They rely on donations. Companies have built up, uh, have built up overstock due to the lockdown. Um, they try to find a way to get responsibly rid of those overstocks. And financial donations will go down in uncertain times. So we definitely need um, help there, uh, need a good ruling uh, in the EU um, to make sure that charities can receive donations without additional cost for donor companies. That was the quick version. And I think that's perfectly in line with the objectives of the Green Deal um, for more sustainability on a social, environmental and economic perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Julianne, for this presentation about the work of, uh, of your charity in particular, but also of, other, of many other similar uh, business model and associations that apply the same strategies and find this solution uh, for the social good huh? and, uh, and how this can be improved uh, from also a regulative, from again, a legislation and regulative point of view. So thanks a lot for that and also for sticking to the time. Uh, that was amazing. So we will pass the floor now to our next two speakers. Uh, First of all, we will pass the floor to Benoit Dab. Benoit Dab uh, is a co-founder and a co-director of Paysan Artisan, which is a cooperative created in 2013. And uh, he is also the president of uh, Collective 5C Collective, a collective of cooperatives of citizen-led cooperatives all over Belgium, particularly in the Francophones part of Belgium, uh, that work for short circuits. And the question for Mr. Dave will be the following one. Sorry. So, Monsieur Dave, uh, vous êtes président du collectif 5C, comme je disais, qui représente uh, pas mal de coopératives citoyennes pour les circuits courts de Bruxelles et de Wallonie. Uh, Pourriez-vous présenter votre réseau, la vision commune de ces coopératives qui forment le réseau, les efforts d'intercoopération que vous menez, un peu comme les présentations antérieures, au-delà de défendre les intérêts et de les promouvoir, comment vous, 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 vous développez les instruments d'intercoopération et uh, comment continuer à promouvoir ce modèle uh, de coopératives citoyennes de circuit court partout en Europe, à travers de l'action collective de l'Union européenne, mais aussi au-delà de l'Union européenne, en sachant que vous avez une expertise sur cela. Et juste un petit commentaire avant de vous donner le, le, la parole. Il y a eu précisément uh, des commentaires des collègues de RIPES International dans le, dans le chat en demandant comment on peut faire plus pour que les acteurs de l'économie sociale et solidaire soient un acteur clé uh, dans la stratégie uh, Farm to Fork de l'Union européenne, donc de la stratégie, dans la stratégie de la farm à la fourchette. Vous êtes un exemple dans ce sens, uh, donc je vous laisse, uh, c'est à vous. Oui, bonjour. Donc, le, le collectif 5C, c'est le collectif des coopératives citoyennes pour le circuit court, donc les 5C sont, sont bien là, créé euh, récemment, en 2017, au départ, avec sept membres seulement. Trois ans plus tard, on a une trentaine de membres, toutes des coopératives. Et donc, vraiment, le mouvement, je dirais, de structuration du circuit court en Wallonie et Bruxelles se structure quand même beaucoup autour de l'économie sociale. Euh, dire que c'est aussi un phénomène relativement nouveau. Toutes ces coopératives qui ont, ont, ont été créées depuis moins de dix ans, presque toutes. Donc, c'est vraiment une émergence récente. Voilà, et le collectif regroupe euh, des coopératives de distribution, donc en circuit court. Donc, on est des distributeurs, on fait de la vente en ligne, on a des magasins, on fait du B2B, donc du grossiste. Euh, voilà, et toutes ces coopératives ont à la fois une ambition vraiment économique, on n'a pas peur des gros mots de, de dire qu'on veut faire du chiffre et, 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 et vendre, mais en même temps, on fait de la politique parce qu'on veut changer vraiment le modèle de, de consommation, le modèle de production, le modèle de distribution. Alors, les valeurs qu'on a, un, ce sont des coopératives citoyennes, donc le capital appartient à des dizaines ou à des centaines de, de, de citoyens. Deux, on travaille sur un territoire déterminé, généralement plus petit qu'une région au sens européen du terme, un petit territoire où on peut mettre en réseau les euh, différents acteurs de ce territoire. Donc, euh, à la fois ben, les paysans, les transformateurs et les consommateurs, mais aussi euh, les associations, les pouvoirs publics locaux, etc. Troisièmement, troisième valeur, ben, c'est le circuit court. 
Donc, le circuit court, ça veut dire un contact direct entre les consommateurs et les producteurs pour qu'il y ait une connaissance, une reconnaissance entre eux, une intelligence aussi euh, partagée. Donc, euh, et, et pour nous, le circuit court, c'est cette relation-là et ce n'est pas une question de distance ou de kilomètres ou de nationalisme. On n'est pas dans le repli euh, euh, comme une organisation ici en Wallonie euh, avait un, un slogan, c'est « Wallon, c'est bon ». quoi. Ben non, euh, on est sur autre chose que le repli nationaliste. Euh, autre valeur, c'est une approche euh, agroécologique euh, de, de l'agriculture, donc moins d'intrants chimiques, moins d'additifs dans les produits transformés. Quatrièmement, on est sur l'idée d'un modèle de distribution qui crée du lien social, donc avec des magasins, des systèmes de vente en ligne qui s'installent dans les quartiers, dans les villages, qui reconstruisent, retissent le lien social. Dernier point qui est pour nous important, on ne pense pas qu'il est possible euh, ni utile de collaborer avec la grande distribution et l'agro-industrie qui sont à l'opposé des valeurs que nous défendons. Alors, voilà les différentes valeurs. Maintenant, qu'est-ce qu'on fait ensemble ben, On mutualise, on a peut-être d'ailleurs commencé comme ça, de l'informatique de, de, de gestion, de l'informatique de vente en ligne. Euh, donc, plusieurs coopératives utilisent le même logiciel qu'on a produit. On partage nos, des, des expéri nos, nos expériences, nos, nos difficultés aussi et, et, et notre savoir-faire sur différentes thématiques. Donc, l'organisation des magasins, euh, le partage, de, donc les groupements d'employeurs et le partage de... De, de personnel entre différents producteurs euh, les, et aussi tout ce qui est atelier partagé de transformation. On constate que dans le circuit court, dans les différentes filières, il manque différents maillons et donc les producteurs ensemble créent ces maillons, créent ces ateliers partagés de transformation, que ce soit un atelier de... Un, un abattoir de, de, de volaille ou un atelier de découpe de viande ou une fromagerie ou une meunerie. Donc voilà, euh, autre chose que l'on fait ensemble, et là on vient de démarrer ce chantier, c'est réfléchir à une logistique euh, à la fois partagée et à la fois interconnectée entre nos différentes coopératives, à différents niveaux géographiques, local, mais aussi sous-régional, donc, pouvoir organiser cette logistique de stockage, de transport ensemble. Autre chantier que nous avons ensemble, on a créé avec une vingtaine d'organisations, donc des euh, syndicats agricoles, des euh, centres de recherche, des ONG, des coopératives de distribution. On a créé donc, euh, la revue Tchac, donc la revue paysanne et citoyenne qui tranche. Donc, c'est une revue d'une centaine de pages avec des articles d'investigation, mais aussi qui raconte les histoires intéressantes de tous les nouveaux projets qui, qui, qui émergent. Et c'est important, cet outil, pour la, la, le combat qu'on mène euh, face euh, ben, au, au discours des communicants de l'agro-industrie et de la grande distribution qui euh, se découvrent des vertus sur le local, sur le bio, etc. Euh, et voilà, et le, le, le cinquième chose qu'on fait ensemble, qu'on commence à faire ensemble puisqu'on est une jeune fédération, c'est de représenter le, 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 le secteur, nos coopératives au niveau des pouvoirs publics. Une des choses qui nous préoccupe aujourd'hui beaucoup, ce sont les, la question des règles sanitaires qui nous sont imposées qui sont en gros les mêmes pour l'agro-industrie que pour l'artisanat de transformation. Euh, je vous donne un exemple. Là, on est en train de créer donc, un petit abattoir de volailles, 300 volailles abattues par, par jour. Un abattoir industriel, c'est 30 000 ou 50 000. Et en gros, on a les mêmes règles. Ce n'est pas possible et ça handicape fortement 
le développement de micro-entreprises de transformation. Donc voilà. Euh, alors, la question au niveau européen, il ben, n'y a pas, donc aujourd'hui, à ma connaissance en tout cas, de fédération européenne des acteurs de circuit court et des acteurs de l'économie sociale en circuit court. Ceci dit, on se parle. Nous, on. on, on on a commencé à arpenter un peu à la fois en Italie, en, en Espagne, en France, on rend visite aux collègues. Ça finira peut-être à aboutir sur quelque chose, mais pour le moment, on n'en est pas encore là. Donc voilà. Euh, mais je vais laisser à Thérèse Marie euh, le Après. soin d'expliquer un petit peu ce qu'on peut attendre de vous. Donc euh, voilà. Mais ça, je, je, je laisse Thérèse Marie. Euh, très bien. Très, très bien. Merci aussi parce qu'on a, comme, comme je disais tout à l'heure, on, on est déjà au-delà du temps prévu. Donc, euh, c'est génial. Ça a été une intervention dans le temps. Ben voilà, on passe la parole à Thérèse Marie Bouchard. À Madame Bouchard, comme, comme Monsieur Dave, Dave pardon d'ailleurs, est co-directrice de Paysans Artisans. Et la question pour Madame, euh, est, bah, bah, aussi important à dire, Paysans Artisans regroupe à 700 coopérateurs, donc 700 membres de la coopérative, dont 5, 150 producteurs, 500 bénévoles et 45 salariés. Et vous avez poursuivi Madame, euh, Madame Bouchard une belle carrière dans la formation, l'administration publique, locale et régionale, et aussi dans l'économie sociale euh, belge et plus concrètement euh, de Wallonie. Est-ce que vous pensez que le modèle de paysan artisan représente un niche, comme très souvent est perçue l'économie sociale au niveau européen, ou bien une partie importante du futur de la production et de la consommation d'aliments Comment l'Union européenne et l'ensemble des administrations publiques peuvent soutenir le développement de modèles comme celui euh, de paysan artisan et des autres coopératives euh, euh, qui, sont, qui font part du collectif 5C et particulièrement dans les cadres du plan de relance. Donc, Madame Bouchard, c'est à vous pour nous dire qu'est-ce que vous espérez, quelles sont vos expectatives par rapport à l'Union européenne. Et je oui. vous demanderai, désolé d'être aussi euh, oui, oui, courte, oui. désolé pour ça, euh, pour, pour, pour être dans les temps. Et je vais essayer de ne pas ré répéter ce que Benoît a dit. Donc, euh, bonjour à tout le monde. Euh, bah, Pays Artisans, on l'a créé aussi en 2013, donc c'était vraiment une belle année puisque c'est aussi l'année de création de Resco. Euh, et euh, on l'a créé ici tout petit au départ et puis on s'est limité à un territoire euh, de 200 000 habitants autour de Namur en, en, en Belgique. Alors vous me demandez, euh, euh, donc, donc on, fait, on a l'habitude de dire qu'on fait trois choses, en fait. on commercialise les produits des producteurs, on, on sensibilise pour faire changer les choses, donc on fait de l'économique et, et du politique et puis on, on, on essaye d'organiser ou de compléter les filières avec des outils tel que euh, petit abattoir, euh, légumerie, bocalerie, conserverie. Donc, on, on est en construction de tout ça et tous ces outils devraient euh, démarrer au printemps. Donc, on ne fait pas que de la commercialisation, on a aussi toute une partie d'appui aux, aux producteurs. Alors, euh, est-ce que c'est une niche ou, ou, ou est-ce que c'est une partie importante du futur Nous, on a envie de dire que c'est une partie importante du futur, aussi bien au niveau de la production agricole que de la distribution ou, ou, ou de la consommation. Pourquoi Parce que le modèle que nous, on promeut, comme les autres coopératives qui sont territorialisées, c'est un modèle avec des petits paysans, des artisans transformateurs, qui, qui ont un savoir-faire, qui ont une fierté, euh, qui sont autonomes. Euh, c'est des producteurs qui travaillent ensemble, hein, on mutualise beaucoup de choses, des outils, des, des espaces, des, des, de, de la main d'œuvre, on commercialise ensemble, on se concerte pour, pour, pour programmer les cultures ensemble, de manière à ne pas se, se marcher sur les pieds. Donc, c'est des producteurs qui sont autonomes, qui définissent leur prix eux-mêmes, qui ne sont pas sous pression de la grande distribution. Et puis, c'est des, des, des producteurs qui connaissent euh, leurs fournisseurs, leurs leur pairs et, et les consommateurs. Donc, c'est un modèle euh, du côté de la production. En fait, on pourrait euh, euh, vraiment avoir des pays en partout, hein, euh, sur petite surface ou plus grande surface. Il suffit, mais le suffit, vous voyez bien ce que ça veut dire, qu'ils aient accès à la terre. Euh, qui est très cher en Belgique, qui est aussi cher dans d'autres pays européens, mais franchement, en Belgique, c'est une catastrophe. Euh, qu'ils aient accès au microcrédit, on en a parlé tout à l'heure, qu'ils aient accès au marché, ben ça, la, des coopératives permettent d'ouvrir de, des marchés, et puis qu'ils qu aient aussi euh, accès souvent à du conseil technique euh, sur le champ. Euh, on a des conseillers économiques chez nous, mais très, très peu de, de conseils techniques. Donc, 
il suffirait vraiment d'avoir un appui du pouvoir public pour pouvoir euh, euh, avoir tous tout, tout ces, tout ces ingrédients et, et alors on pourrait vraiment euh, avoir encore beaucoup plus de producteurs. Du côté de la distribution, euh, malgré la, la marche très faible de la coopérative, euh, on peut, euh, peut s'en sortir sur l'activité euh, avec, avec une distribution des magasins de proximité au cœur des quartiers et, et au cœur des villages et remettre du lien social euh, via, nos, via nos magasins, via vos, nos, 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 nos lieux euh, qui ne sont pas le lot des voies de communication mais qui sont vraiment au cœur des, des quartiers, ça nous semble important. Et c'est aussi, ça nous semble aussi important que ces magasins, que, ces, que nos systèmes de vente soient accessibles à tout le monde. Et donc, euh, il y a un travail de sensibilisation à faire, notamment euh, avec le milieu populaire, on y reviendra tout à l'heure. Et puis, alors, au niveau de la consommation, il faut reconnecter le consommateur à la production euh, par des visites chez les producteurs, euh, par des conférences, par, euh, par des ciné-débats aussi, qui permet euh, de mieux comprendre euh, les, les différents enjeux pour qu'il y ait plus de sens finalement dans les, dans les actes de consommation et aussi plus, plus de solidarité euh, par rapport aux producteurs euh, qui sont là euh, sur notre territoire comme ailleurs. Donc oui, pour nous, c'est vraiment un modèle qui doit prendre toute sa place et pas être resté dans une niche. Euh, et donc pour ça, on a bien, bien besoin des, des pouvoirs publics. Alors comment ou quel, quel est le rôle des... Hein, c'était une de vos questions, c'était quel est le rôle des, des autorités publiques euh, ben D'abord, il y a les autorités, les administrations du territoire euh, qui ont des terres, par exemple, et qui pourraient permettre euh, aux petits producteurs d'avoir accès à la terre plus facilement, ou en tous les cas, il de, 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 y, a, y, a, y a toute une réflexion à avoir et pour réguler ce prix de la terre et que ce soit euh, beaucoup plus accessible. Euh, les autorités publiques du territoire qui font aussi de la restauration collective, donc faire appel au circuit court, ce n'est pas rien, euh, ce n'est pas qu euh, que des mots, mais c'est aussi pouvoir y mettre le prix pour garantir le prix juste pour les producteurs. Et puis, c'est des partenariats constructifs, par exemple, pour permettre l'insertion sociale via nos coopératives, via les producteurs, en essayant de, de, de laisser une place à tout le monde, donc y compris euh, un public et des, des travailleurs qui sont les plus éloignés de, de l'emploi au départ et qui retrouvent sens finalement euh, en mettant les mains dans la terre ou en faisant un boulot collectif. Euh, on a besoin, donc ça c'était pour les autorités publiques du territoire, au niveau de la région et de, de, de l'Union européenne, si on s'en sort pour l'activité, pour le financement de l'activité, même avec des marges faibles, par contre, ce qui est difficile, c'est le soutien euh, à l'investissement. Alors en région Wallonne, on a deux systèmes, deux, deux choses qui ne fonctionnent pas, pas trop mal. C'est euh, la région double le capital citoyen pour des projets d'économie sociale qui en valent la peine. Donc quand on met un euro, la région met un euro. Euh, C'est via la Walter. Euh, et puis euh, on a aussi euh, tous les 3-4 ans un appel pour des halls relais agricoles ce qui permet d'ailleurs, ce qui a permis de financer une partie des infrastructures dont on vous a parlé, légumerie, bocalerie, abattoir. Si on veut changer d'échelle et si on veut aller encore plus loin, on aura vraiment besoin de toutes les capacités d'investissement et donc d'un appui des, 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 des projets comme FEDER ou le FSE pour, pour, pour ces investissements. Deuxième chose que, pour laquelle on a besoin d'un appui aussi, euh, nos structures, c'est pour des projets plus spécifiques, comme par exemple remettre de l'activité économique dans les quartiers populaires, en remettant du maraîchage, des ateliers de fabrication. Euh, là, euh, on, a, on a vraiment besoin d'un appui parce que ça sort de notre euh, périmètre. Euh, on, on a aussi... Pardon, Marie-Thérèse, je vous ai muté sans vouloir. Désolé. Voilà, comme voilà. ça. Voilà. Je vais de toute façon vous demander aussi de, de, de finir au plus vite possible. Désolé. Oui, oui, euh, je termine. Donc, euh, on a besoin d'aide une fois qu'on sort un peu de notre périmètre d'action pour euh, des projets plus spécifiques, euh, comme, euh, comme être dans les quartiers et remettre de l'activité économique dans les quartiers plus populaires, euh, mais aussi, euh, euh, par exemple, pour... Euh, de la formation. On, a, on est maintenant sur un projet à Terrec 
cours de la formation d'ouvrier maraîcher fruticulteur en circuit court, donc sur le terrain via la technique du groupement d'employeurs. Et ça permet alors d'amener euh, des compétences euh, pour les producteurs, euh, des, 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 des personnes qui sont qualifiées, qui peuvent venir en appui euh, et des personnes qui émargent souvent de l'insertion et, et des CPS. Voilà, donc si on, veut, si on veut investir, si on veut avancer, on va vraiment avoir besoin de, de, des pouvoirs publics de tout, de tout niveau. Merci beaucoup, Thérèse-Marie, pour cette intervention. Uh, very interesting also about, uh, about uh, how to support these type of initiatives to scale up, to grow, uh, and uh, very interesting uh, financial schemes from Wallonia that doubles the, that doubles to the investment in every social economy, Europe, in every social economy project from one euro invested, the region puts an additional one euro to support these projects. Uh, Vice President Timmermans is trying to, um, is trying to join us. He's having some uh, trouble in joining us, but uh, my colleague Nicola, uh, Nicholas Clark is, uh, is uh, working hard to support him. So I am confident that we will have, the, we will have uh, Executive Vice President Timmermans with us in a minute. And before, I will give the floor uh, to our other uh, keynote speaker, Maya Gopel, Director of Research at the New Institute, a political economist, an important voice uh, for the sustainable transformation of our societies, author of uh, books such as The Great, the Great Manships, Mind Shift, sorry. Uh, Mrs. Gopel also spoke in uh, Brussels Economic Forum at the beginning of this, uh, I mean, in September, I believe. Uh, and I believe that she's a, a very strong uh, voice from the political economy on how to transform uh, how to transform our economies, how to be more sustainable and uh, and uh, confront these transitions that we really need to do and we really need to do as soon as possible. Mrs. Gopal, the floor is yours. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much for everyone contributing and uh, thank you for the invitation to come here and, and join. What I've been doing is try to listen carefully to different points and what I would like to do is take a viewpoint on trying to make a linkages between all the different things that you've said to a certain degree from a point of view that is basically what my work focuses on, which is the role of paradigm shifts and mind shifts in order for us to really be able to see the connections between lots and lots of the small little projects that we've now seen that are for me, when we think about, we want to achieve sustainable development goals, the countries have agreed to that. So in the essence, those are the nucleus and the seeds of the new. And then to also go into what Andrea has been saying about the defining and the reference frameworks, especially in economics, that we then have to update to a new reality if that reality is changing so much. So that we know about the damage on ecological systems of our former way of doing things, and we do know that it wasn't good enough to follow economic efficiency and growth gains, but we've lost a lot on the social side and the social coherence side as well. And so this is why I think also the point that Bernard was making with this awakening and an alliance spinning has a lot to do with how we speak about the things that we deem possible, desirable, and um, also productive in the true economic sense. And I think the first thing to think about is when we are talking about a social economy or now a green economy, to just be, let, yes, more outspoken about saying what this actually means is that until now we have a not social enough economy and we do have a brown economy. So we are very clear if those positive framings are the deviation from the status quo, we should be very clear at pointing out that what we have right now is neither normal nor some, something to go back to after COVID and with all the recovery funds, but something to finally let go of and to be more courageous about this and to say, maybe that's what we can really agree on. That the model that we have pursued that worked for a longer period of time, but has had those collateral damages that we see very clearly now has to let go of. And then there is much more space for the different alternatives that want to emerge and that then can do also experimentation and culturally embedded diversified Um, solutions to creating the value that in the United, uh, European Union and beyond should be created when we think about economics as a relationship, as a productive relationship between people and between people and planet. And this for me is one of the most important things that we shift away from a thinginess and a monetary way of looking at it all, but it is relationships and it can find expressions in very different forms of indicators and measurements. And this is why I think it is so important to also understand how much COVID in terms of this mind shift and um, the way to look at what was really 
the most important thing that people felt was the most important to protect were very good guiding stars into saying those should probably also be the sectors that we want to protect first. And we've had here housing and we've had here food and we had here health provision and we had here the support of those that can't meet their needs on their own right now. So the relationship side also there really being very important. So to always be clear, as we had so much trade-off talk, the trade-off between social goals and environmental goals, that we have very clearly seen that those are two sides of the same story. And they are really the two sides of a progress idea of the 21st century. It has to be about trade-ins. And we have to find economic incentives and the governing frameworks and the VAT was just one of the examples. We have to abolish those solutions that humans have made at times where we didn't see all the consequences maybe enough, but now those are the trade-off making tools that we have installed and they're human made so we can take them away so we can get to the trade-in solutions or between the social and the environmental. And this is why I think some terms like the planetary health agenda, for example, was a huge step forward because it came out of a new perspective out of the health workers of the world, 40 million of them represented in a statement to the World Health Organization, clearly saying, if you want to protect people, you want to protect the environments they live in because we are connected to the environment. The air we breathe has particles that sit in our lung that make us risk um, patients for COVID. So it is really about understanding this connectivity between humans, their environment, and amongst each other. And the virus there also really helped us to understand this vicinity and the importance of understanding those relationships. And this is why I think what Julianne was saying about the resilience ideas is what has to be in business models. And it is natural for this community to say it, economies should be serving people and be cognizant of the planet. But to really then also say which are the business models that can help this and which are the business models that have driven us into the trade-off relationships. So how do we reshape what should be more the backbone business models of our societies rather than exceptions to the normality that is not allowing for this integration as well. And I think one of the reports I found interesting came out from the JRC. Now I'm speaking from a science point of view on resilience. So how can we work with this term resilience before it evaporates again from the discourse? Because it has been so important there because also the resilience of having diversified solutions, multiple embedded ones, so that one shock doesn't impact the whole system. And we have creativity on delivering on the core functions of a system as a knowledge base diversity in itself is a value when you think about having resilient systems. And they are report on, um, from the Joint Research Center did diver, um, differentiate between the sources. So how do we make sure that we have buffers, for example, in our health systems, in our care systems, so on the social side, but also on the environmental side, so that the provisioning of the sources for running the economy are not um, too much run down. Then the production processes, how do we organize those? How do we make sure that, and I think the example of the financial system with diversified banks, et cetera, has been a very strong argument there in 28. So how do we make sure production processes are organized so they can be resilient? And also the outcomes then, obviously, to make sure that we constantly update the solutions, the human-made intermediary means, so that we're not sacrificing the outcomes, so that we're not going back on having achieved certain social standards and in, in the protection of the environment in order to save an economy. Because if an economy can't serve the health or the well-being of the people, whilst not running down the resources of doing that in the future, what is an economy for then? And to just be more outspoken about this, why should we have an economy that is not supporting the well-being of its people, and is sacrificing resources for future generations? And this is why I think this linking between the Green Deal framework and that being a social deal at the same time is crucial so that we don't fall into the place of letting some actors that would like to keep the status quo in the trade-off regime and to tell us when we also talk about what kind of growth do we want, where is consumerism leading us in rich societies, or you want to take away the development point of view or possibilities from the global south of the people that don't have enough material satisfaction. Obviously, that's not what we're talking about. So how do we divert, um, or newly define terms like value, value creation? And there are some things on the horizon, like a new reporting scheme for um, businesses in the next year. So value creation really at the core of business models, as is normal here, should be a standard that all the other businesses should look at too. 
how do we conceptualize wealth and well-being in a new way so that the competitiveness of Europe is more about regenerative economies and thus more resilient economies. And the last two points I would like to reframe is productivity so that we have really the social and the environmental aspects of productivity in there as well, not just economic productivity. And investment in itself is an interesting term because it means to invest into something. And what we are calling investment quite often, I think it was mentioned really well before by Andrea and others, is an extraction of surplus value to places that are not here. So how with playing with those words, we really put meaning to what we say, where we're going, and then change the human made frameworks with which we're trying to govern so that we can marry the green and the social. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya, for being a contributor today. It's, uh, it's an honor for us to have you on board with, uh, uh, because I mean, it's obvious that you are a key actor in producing ideas on, on, on this sustainable translation. So thanks for your intervention. I believe that finally we have uh, Vice President Timmermans with us. But before passing the floor to Vice President Timmermans, I will pass the floor to our colleague, Monica Semedo, MEP uh, from Luxembourg Renew Europe and also co-chair of the Social Economy Intergroup. She has boats at 2 p.m., so she has to leave us in some minutes. So at least for a, for a comment from your side, uh, Monica. Yes, uh, I hope you see me. No, now you see me. <laughs> Hello, hola a todos. Uh, I know there are many uh, also Spanish uh, participants. Uh, um, hello to everyone, to the fellow co-chairs, uh, panelists and, and the participants, and of course uh, to you, Victor. Um, thank you for having me today uh, and for organizing the event and uh, all the contributions we, we, we heard. It was very interesting. Um, so a lot that we can take with us and, and, and work on it and discuss on it in the future. So uh, it was really interesting um, also how social enterprises and organizations are at the heart of the green transition and are essentially making um, this transition green and fair. That's one of the main points. It has to be green and fair. Um, so um, as part of the European Green Deal, uh, the Commission is striving to eliminate the net emissions of greenhouse uh, gases by 2050 and also the European Parliament and to reduce the, the, the resources by promoting the circular economy, economy. So these targets that we fixed must be done in a manner that is really just and inclusive so that no one is left behind during that transition. Social economy enterprises, they create jobs, they have to make our society and economy more social, sustainable and digital, and they create the jobs of tomorrow. And that's a great hope for the young generation here in the European Union. Um, but they should also have the excluded and the most disadvantaged in our society. Um, a key aspect of this is ensuring investment into people, their ideas, their creativity, their innovational spirit, um, and not just focusing on profit. Profit is okay, <laughs> but should be reinvested for social benefit. Um, so um, thank you to all the, the panelists of today. Merci beaucoup <laughs> à tout le monde. Uh, we heard from Dirk, renewable, renewable energy. Um, it was fascinating, uh, the initiative uh, where cit citizens join your own and participate, participate in renewable energy projects. Um, we heard about uh, great traineeships, which is very important. I was one of the um, I will be one of the rapporteurs of, of, of the next traineeships and uh, clean energy um, synergism um, on the project in London was very fascinating. So thank you for that. Also, Socha, I hope I spelled it right. <laughs> if not, then tell me. <laughs> I will do better next time. Um, also for the need of decent housing. Housing is also a great problem in Luxembourg. Um, and I think there is a shift. There is a shift in thinking of, of making it more sustainable in the future. 
um, so uh, that's the next step. And that's, I think there is where social economy drops in also. Um, it's not just about money, but also about um, enterprises and companies that care and that do that. So I think that's the next uh, step after we have, I hope, uh, overcome this pandemic. Um, so, and Bernard and Andrea, um, social economy and finance, very important. Uh, access to credits are so important for all these innovative uh, companies uh, and those people, um, especially as uh, ethical banks, um, just because we talked about a lot about um, um, also green and sustainable bonds and financing. So uh, as I come from Luxembourg, I, I can say that Luxembourg is one of the fourth one in, in, in green financing. Uh, Luxembourg listed 2007, the first green bond. And just a month ago, it, uh, it um, uh, issued the first social bond so that social projects are supported. And I'm really, <laughs> I really can say I'm really lucky about that uh, because um, green is important, sustainable is important, but also the social um, aspect. So uh, it was under the show program, just to be, just to be clear. As a shadow of the ESF Plus, so the European Social Fund Plus um, program, um, I know that the regulation lays down provisions in order to create a market ecosystem to increase the supply of and access to uh, finance uh, for social enterprises, as well as to meet the demand from those who need it most, in particular, unemployed women, vulnerable people who wish to start or, or develop micro enterprise, a micro enterprise. So um, this objective, just to, to give an answer also to those who ask which funds uh, will, 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 will finance that. This objective will also be addressed uh, through financial instruments and uh, budgetary guarantee under the social investment and skills policy window of the InvestEU fund. So we heard many panelists today and it was a great, great exchange. I would really like to thank you and just as a final comment, I want to say that on a social um, perspective, the lockdown measures have affected every one of us, everyone in the society, everyone in the EU, um, but the impact has been uneven. So resulting in new inequalities and we should tackle that. And we can tackle that with all the great people who are investing in social economy with their ideas for better society. So let's do that. And let's really work for the next generation EU. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Monica, thank you very much for this intervention. And indeed, uh, the social economy, uh, thank you also for having stayed a bit longer. And, uh, and of course, we, uh, we understand that you will leave at any, at any moment uh, to join the boats. But thanks for this intervention and happy to cooperate uh, with the whole social economy intergroup to build a better uh, to build a better future from the social economy perspective. To conclude, uh, Vice President Timmermans has, uh, uh, has left the meeting for some technical issues. Uh, so finally, he will not be able to be with us. He has, uh, I mean, I have been contacted by his cabinet asking to, uh, to say sorry to all the viewers, to the members of the social economy intergroup and all, to all the participants for this uh, by Monica. He will send a video in any case uh, that we will join to the report uh, with a message for the social economy community. Uh, to conclude the event, I will pass the floor to our vice president and director of NCA. Uh, the European Network of Social Integration Enterprises, Patricia Busi, for a short message and, uh, and uh, to conclude the event. Yes, thank you very much, Victor. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, all of you, all the panelists and all the people that are still following us. Uh, first of all, I want to underline the fact that uh, within this webinar, we cannot have a, a question directly, but we will take uh, uh, attention to all the questions that are in the chat and we will try to introduce all your input 
in our report, so to take care of everything on all your um, contribution and uh, feel free also to contact uh, the social economy uh, intergroup uh, secretariat and social economy Europe in order to uh, continue the, the discussion about this point and to react. Uh, concerning my last conclusion, they will be very briefly because we have already had a very good conclusion from uh, Monica. Uh, so I will uh, uh, just say that uh, within uh, uh, Social Economy Europe, we will continue our activity in order to uh, raise uh, our voice. Uh, I heard many, many examples that uh, are there since many years, but that are really on, in line with the uh, all uh, Green Deal. So this means that we were there before all this and we were already doing uh, a transition uh, to green uh, before this green deal, we are so the uh, answer to to this green deal, and we can be considered as are the real um, business for the future, are the real economy for the future, uh, especially also as a social economy with uh, all our principle of democracy, participation, participation of uh, uh, the citizens. Uh, what I can concretely say is that we will have the European Action Plan on Social Economy at the end, uh, in the autumn 2021. So we will work in order to put some, uh, all or some of uh, all pro of our proposal within this action plan. Uh, I take note about uh, many idea. I can come can, can back and uh, be absolutely in line with the need to have found for financing for social economy. Uh, there is a key role for the recovery fund. We need the recovery fund to really arrive to the local initiative. We need also the cohesion fund and uh, the investing fund to arrive to the local. This will be uh, absolutely one of our key messages. And then for sure also some changes in the regulation uh, we have heard the idea of the uh, ethical finance on the changing on the general block exemption regulation. We can really think to a general block exemption regulation that take care of the fact that social economy is doing economy in another way and so need to be recognized. Uh, we have also some uh, issue concerning the VAT and the donation and also the VAT and the cooperative status. So we will take care also about this. I mean, I try to summarize more or less all the uh, requests at European level or concerning regulation and uh, financing. And so I think that uh, we can close uh, in this way, hoping really that the social economy would be the economy for the future because this is a green economy, because it's a fair economy and put green and social together. So I think Victor, you, you can still have the last floor and I thank you all for your participation. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thanks all. Uh, this is the strength of the social economy community when we work together, more than 200 people uh, here today with us. Also, when we cooperate with uh, uh, with key institutions such as the Social Economy Intergroup, this cooperation is uh, is uh, is part of the future and part of the future to uh, not miss the train of the European Action Plan for the Social Economy. As most of the speakers say said, the next months are crucial. Let's work together to ensure uh, that the European Union has a real commitment uh, with the social economy and really promotes our model. Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you all. So, Thank you. Bye. Arrivederci. Grazie. <laughs>